So who would the strongest be? Uh, the cat the dog. The men. The men. And it says once more, implying that it's happened before, right? So here we go again with the same events. And that was written by William Siemens. The discovery bobs in the river as the gentlemen on board unfurl her sails. There is no wind yet, but their intent is clear. They have loaded up all of our food, and as soon as the breeze lifts, they will set sail for England. There are 10 or 12 gentlemen on board, and they are leaving the 25 of us commoners behind to starve. Now, so many of you were right with your predictions, weren't you? In twos and threes, men come out from the fort to stare at the discovery. I'll shoot them all, one of the soldiers declares, and he prepares to load his musket. Don't be stupid, Henry says. They'll shoot you before you can fire a second shot, and they hit some of the rest of us as well. They've already killed us says John Layden. You think we'll make it through the winter? The river will freeze over our fish nets. The birds are already gone and there's nothing more to harvest. We might as well be shot. At least it will be a quick death. My stomach grumbles for its breakfast. I wonder how long it takes to die of hunger. I wonder if it hurts. The men continue to argue. Some think we'll be able to trade with the Indians, and others insist that the Indians will not trade now in midwinter when they are probably going half hungry themselves. Many want to kill the gentlemen or die trying. Reverend Hunt is standing near me. He is staring out at the ship, his face set in grim lines. Is all lost, Reverend? Are we doomed? I ask him. He puts his hand on my shoulder. Do you see any wind? He asks. I take a good look at the surface of the river. There is hardly a ripple. I shake my head. Hardly a ripple on the surface of the river implies what, boys and girls? No wind. No wind. Because what does the wind do? Push the surface. It pers pushes the surface, right, and it causes those ripples. Then the discovery is not going anywhere yet. There is time for me to pray for a miracle. He walks off in the direction of the fort to the chapel. I listen to the men argue about how to shoot to kill the most gentlemen at once. Richard touches my arm. His eyes are bright. Look, he whispers, pointing back behind us. At first I think I'm seeing a vision that my imagination is playing tricks. I see a dozen native men emerging from the forest near the fort. Some are bare chested despite the cold and some have deerskin mantles thrown over one shoulder. They are walking quickly. There is one man among them who is not quite a native, though not quite a white man either. His hair is reddish brown, but long and shaggy. He is wearing a deerskin mantle and also slops and shoes. So he has half native clothing and half what? White. Wait, maybe it's John White. I mean, John Smith. Smith, good guess. Um, yeah, we're using him from the Roanoke colony. Um, suddenly, it is as if my eyes clear, and I know who I'm seeing. Captain Smith! I cry, and I run full speed to greet him. Everyone, when, everyone starts clamoring at once. They're leaving us, and they've stolen our food! With no stores left, those good, no good, lazy gentlemen will starve. Where have you been? Captain Smith holds up his hand to silence us. All right, be Captain Smith, boys and girls. It's like, shh, enough. All right, there's like a barrage of questions. Hey, um, I, I saw him and we went home. We followed him to the fort and our soldiers worked to load the cannons. 
and aim them squarely at the discovery. And then Captain Smith marches down to the water's edge. Hold or be sunk, he shouts. Disembark at once or die. We watch as the gentlemen on board the ship huddle and talk. And after a few minutes conferring with one another, Master Archer shouts out, Where are Jay Robinson and Thomas Emery? Boys and girls, will you write a synonym for conferring, please? What's a synonym for conferring? Go back in the text and see if you can figure it out. We read the context clues. It has a suffix, so the root word's confer. What do you think conferring means? Wonderful, wonderful, fantastic. I'm seeing such good synonyms. Now take your synonym and go back and plug it in. Does it make sense? Don't erase it yet. Go back and plug it in. I've seen so many great synonyms for conferring. When you reread that sentence with the word that you chose and the word that you wrote, does it make sense? If it makes sense, stand up for me, please. Oh, you have several. Pick one and plug it in. If your synonym makes sense, stand up. If it doesn't, think of another and try that one with that sentence using context clues. Very good. Okay, if you're standing to help others, hold your chalkboard or your dry erase board so others can see it. Look at all of the different synonyms we have for the word conferring. Discussing, talking, deciding, speaking, talking it out, communicating, Agreeing. Very good, boys and girls. All right, have a seat. Captain Smith shakes his head. Dead, he answers. Killed by the savages. Now, do you remember how one of them was killed? What's that? Uh, roasted over in a fire. Roasted over in a fire, yeah. <laughs> they, um, they were killed by the natives, and that's how we know one of them was killed. So why do they put such violence in our book that we read? Why would they tell us this? It's showing history. It's showing history. Very good. It's showing the real facts of what happened and how our country was established. Um, the gentlemen confer some more and then begin to load the longboat with provisions to bring back to shore. A cheer goes up among the commoners. Our food is being returned to us. But I have an uneasy feeling. Why did the gentlemen change their minds as soon as Captain Smith told them that those two men are dead? I watched them paddle the longboat towards shore and think it almost <coughs> feels too easy, this change in their plans. Boys and girls, what's happening right now is the author, through Sam, through the character of Sam, is alluding to some foreshadowing. Some, some ideas that perhaps things are not going to go as well as most people think. Do you ever get that uneasy feeling? It's like, ah, oh, this is just too good to be true. Something's just not feeling quite right here. Well, that's what Sam is experiencing. His gut instinct is telling him something is not quite right. And this helps his um, survival because he pays close attention to people and they're communicating and their reactions and these feelings that he gets makes him super aware and keeps him um, in survival mode. We turn to attention to Captain Smith with a hundred questions. Where did you go? Why did you stay away so long? Did you bring corn? Did the Indians try to kill you? Later, he says. I will tell you all about it later. The group of native men who have come with Captain Smith stand quietly watching as the gentlemen roll barrels of provisions up the riverbank. Once the discovery has been unmanned, Captain Smith turns back toward the fort. Pegua, he says to the native men. Now, do we know what that word means? Who do you think knows what it means? I do. Because he was reading that book that trailer. That means to go with him, I say to Richard. Richard and I follow too. Captain Smith brings the men to the fort where two of our cannons sit perched on an artillery platform. He speaks to them in Algonquin as best as he can. Here, guns, I promise, to great poetin, you take to him. So what is he going to give them? Guns. Not only the guns, but the what? 
cannons. Can you believe it that Captain John Smith would agree to such a thing? Does that sound like the Captain John Smith we know? Right, and there's something else. Very smart. There's something else. Let's see what happens. My jaw drops. We are forbidden to give the Indians muskets or swords, but Captain Smith is giving them cannons? The Indian men gather around one of the cannons to lift it. They strain. They switch positions. They team up. They push and pull with all of their might. Their faces turn red. Veins on their neck stand out, and they sweat despite the icicles hanging from the trees. I glance over to Captain Smith, and I see that he is stifling a smile. What are you doing when you're, when you're stifling a smile? I'm trying to hide it. Yes, you're trying to hide the smile. Like you're trying not to smile. You're trying not to smile. You're trying to cover it. I think it's what happens when you know something, but you're trying not to let on that you know something. I give something easy for Carrie, he offers. The would-be cannon carries, carriers look relieved. They finally leave with handfuls of intricately colored beads, some bells, small mirrors, and a large copper pot. And I wonder if the great Powhatan will be satisfied with the switch. How many of you think Captain Smith knew they wouldn't be able to carry those wonderful great big guns he promised? Yeah, and he's like, all right, I'll do you a favor then. I'll give you this stuff that's so much easier to take instead. Quite clever, right? So the stuff they ended up giving him that was easier to carry, is that threatening at all? Mm -hmm. Right. So so very clever. They were trying to trick him because they knew they were going to try to get the Who's they? You mean him? The Indians. No, the Indians didn't they realize they were being a trick. Get Okay, now will you tell us where you've been, John Layden asked. So please put your finger where we are, boys and girls, because I keep um, jumping away from the text. If you need help, raise your hand let me know. We're in the middle of 118. Um, Did you really meet the great Pawhatan, I ask. Can't a man get breakfast before he has to give an oration, Captain Smith says. Richard and I find a half barrel of corn and cook up a large pot of hominy. After breakfast, we keep the common cook fire going. So we can warm ourselves while Captain Smith tells us his story. Most of the common men come to listen. The gentlemen are again nowhere to be seen. They are off sulking like scolded dogs. I are they off scold are they off sulking like scolded dogs, I wonder, or hatching a new plan. But once Captain Smith begins his story, I don't give the gentleman another thought. Two hundred savages came upon me, he says. They captured me and they took me prisoner. They had paraded me from one village to another. And at each village there were ceremonies and dancing and dancers painted red and black like fearsome devils. And there was feasting, lots of feasting. I was sure that as soon as I was fat enough for their liking, they would kill me and eat me. I thought the Powhatans were not cannibals, I blurt out. Captain Smith shakes his head. I didn't think so, but why else were they fattening me up? He raises his eyebrows at me. Finally, I was taken to the village of Werewakamoko. I was presented to, to the Wahasanakak, the great Powhatan himself. Am I pronouncing those words right? Probably not. Devil. But does it matter? No. Why doesn't it matter? Because. What kind of words are they? Old timey words. Words. Well, they're old timey words. They're American words. words. They're hard right? words to pronounce. Then they're hard words to pronounce. And they're proper they nouns. Know their language. Remember when they're proper nouns? Is that the word you're looking for? So if they're capitalized. P, yeah, you're. Nice. <laughs> um, he sat on the throne covered with a large robe made of raccoon skins with the tail still on. All around him sat his court, upwards of 200 men and women, their faces and shoulders painted red and crowns of white bird feathers on the heads. They had another feast, and then two large stones were brought and placed in front of Chief Powhatan. Captain Smith pantomimes, lifting two heavy, heavy stones. That word pantomimes. I want you to stop and talk with a partner. What could that word mean? 
go ahead and stop it.